Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Fred Minnick Show. I am Fred, and this podcast is brought to you by The Beeline, a northern Kentucky bourbon experience, a mashup of five Kentucky bourbon trail craft distillers, six unique bourbon bars, and five bourbon-focused restaurants across from Cincinnati in the edge of bourbon country. Learn more at findyoursippingpoint.com. That's findyoursippingpoint.com. And soon we will get out of this. And we're all going to get back together and sit down for a nice bourbon and a good meal. And we can do that in Northern Kentucky. We'll be doing an event there as soon as it re everything reopens. So go to findyoursippingpoint.com for more information. This week's guest uh, has a lot of awards and a lot of things to be proud of a lot of accomplishments five-time grammy winner neil geraldo started a whiskey but i was really more interested in the in the um i was really interested in the music side of it because he is he's he is an insider but he's also ultra talented that has touched everything from uh Jesse's Girl, Rick Springfield's classic Jesse's Girl. He's married to the iconic Pat Benatar, who, you know, basically it, her career is, you know, closely tied to Neil. Obviously, he, he's their, you know, their partners. So her success is his success and vice versa. And so Neil is a, is a fascinating, fascinating human being. And I learned in this interview that his grandpa made some illegal uh, spirits back in the day in Cleveland. And because I like to tie the trivia to the to the guests and, and whiskey, uh, we're, that's going to be the trivia. It's going to be this. Cleveland is going to be the focus. So this week's trivia question is based on where Neil grew up. Neil grew up in Cleveland, and we learned that his... Um, his grandpa was making a little bit of illicit uh, whiskey and brandy in, in the basement. But during that time, there was actually a privately held uh, distillery there that started uh, after Prohibition. What was the name of that distillery? Now, that answer is going to be coming up after the interview with five-time Grammy Award winner, um, someone who has sold more than 45 million records, has worked with Rick Derringer, Steve Forbitt, the Dell Lord, Scott Kempner, Beth Hart, Rick Springfield, Kenny Loggins, and is, is the man behind uh, Pat Benatar. Everyone likes to say there's a behind every good um, man, there's a woman, which I think is kind of a you know shitty comment to make these days. But uh, behind Pat Benatar is the great, the one, the only, Neil Geraldo. Please enjoy the interview. Yeah. All right, I'm joined with Neil. Neil, how are you doing, sir? Good to see you. Good, Fred. Good to see you too, pal. Uh, I got to tell you, you're, um, you're one of the most um, iconic people in music, and I love that you're, you're, uh, you're a big whiskey fan because a lot of people in music are whiskey fans, but they don't really sip it. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I, I understand. Well, <laughs> thank you for the iconic bit. I don't really consider myself iconic, but thank you for that. Well, you know, it's a funny story. When I started playing in local bars, um, I had this band called Lover's Lane, and I used to wear a stocking cap on my head like Rocky, you know, like uh, Sylvester Stallone or Rocky, and mm -hmm. this black leather jacket. And I would eat these sociable crackers. And it said sociables. And when we got to the bar to rehearse, they, the club owner let us use the bar. There was a bottle of ten high bourbon there, and he would he would say, "You can drink as much as you want, but make sure you leave the empties there, so I know what to order more." So we would start rehearsal with a little bit of whiskey and sociable crackers. So <laughs> that's how it started. Well, you know that ten high that was made in Illinois, so you were you were drinking some of the stuff that you know a lot of Kentuckians didn't even consider bourbon. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't even know what it was. I was it was on the on the bar, so I drank it. So. Now you've had an amazing, uh, an amazing career. What, what have been some of your highlights? Do you feel like? 
I mean, well, is it the five Grammys? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, actually, one of the highlights was when I joined the Rick Derringer band, Derringer, in 1978. Uh, oh, wow. I was working in a local band in Cleveland, and I was really getting uh, desperate, thinking, am I ever going to live my dream, right? And I, I play a lot of piano. I started playing piano when I was about 13. And then I had these visions of maybe I'll just, um, I was, I think I was 21 at the time. I was thinking, well, maybe I could just, settle down, have a family and be a cocktail piano player in the bars, you know, and do happy hour and all that. Cause I love all the standards and jazz and all these things. So um, I was ready to give it up. Then I got this audition to audition for Rick. And when I joined that band, uh, my whole life changed. From then on, I learned from him. Uh, he taught me uh, great stuff. I was all ears and all eyes. And from that moment, it really, my whole life changed dramatically. And that was the one of the one of the greatest highlights of my life, right there. That's awesome. It was phenomenal. Now, when did you and and how did you and Pat meet? I I just finished a record for Rick called Guitars of Women. Ironically, right. <laughs> so, and the other ironic thing is I played more piano on the record than guitar. You know, so um, I was just I just finished my portion of the record up, and I was ready to go back to Cleveland, my home. And a uh, phone rang. I, I write it more uh, lyrically, much more prose in the book I'm writing, but I'll give you the short step of it. I was getting ready to leave to go home to Cleveland. The phone rang in the studio said, there's somebody who wants to talk to you. They just signed this person to a record deal. And this person wants to put a band together and wants to have a partner, a musical partner. This person just sang. So I says, well, maybe I heard of him. What's his name? And they says, no, it's not a him. It's a her. And then I, I laughed on the phone. I thought it was one of my buddies in Cleveland just busting my chops. You know, this kind of thing. I said, no, nah, no, nah, that's okay. Nah. And he goes, no, 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 hold on. Don't hang up. I go, I know you must be one of my Goomba buddies. I know you're messing with me. And then uh, he said, no, I'm, I'm dead serious. He goes, I'll, I'll make you a deal. If you drive down, I was in Woodstock here. If you drive down and meet this person, and if you don't get along, I will either give you a hotel for the night and give you a free ticket back to Cleveland. I says, okay, fair enough. I never went back to Cleveland. Oh, I wow. Stayed, and it worked. Yeah, it was, uh, it was phenomenal. And uh, that was another great, great special moment. So, And you all have been together for how long now? I mean, like 4,000 years, actually. <laughs> <laughs> <We're going out. laughs> um, well, since, since that day, it was in May of 1979. And uh, we became uh, musical partners. Uh, and the cool thing about Patricia was... Um, my whole life, what I was looking for was a great singer. Mm -hmm. you know, I like to write songs and I play a lot of instruments and I love songs and I like to compose and create these things. But my voice is not something I love. I was looking for somebody who could really sing. And then when I met her and she says, well, you know, I don't play any instruments except my voice. I go, well, that's one of the greatest. Thank you. She goes, well, I don't play anything. And I really look, I want to be, have a partner. So to write and help write and, and produce and arrange and create this, this band have a rock band and I says well I think this is perfect timing and that's that's really how it started and we we're both thankful and the thing it's you know it's like business too and it's business and bands are very similar you have to get the core in the front of, and then the, the it's not a trickle down everybody plays a very important part but you have to start with an idea a thought and it has to go from there so we had one and we both needed each other and it really worked. It was phenomenal. What's the, what's, what's the inspiration when you're putting, when you're putting together a song, like where do you, what, where do you go? How do you, what's your element that gets your, gets you in your groove? Okay, here it is. I truly believe this. Uh, everybody is a songwriter. Everybody's a writer, composer, creator, all these things. Everybody is. And it's a conduit, open conduit. I try to open the conduit up. Many times, this is that right brain, left brain, whole, whole the phenomenon that happens. I try to let myself open up the conduit and let ideas come to me. The harder you try to make that happen, the further away you go. So mm -hmm. that's why driving is a phenomenal place to write a song in the shower, because you, you go to this different place and then an inspiration comes. But here's the other thing. It's a blessing and a curse, I call it. Every minute of my life, 
I am looking. Everything is a song idea. Everything is a song title. Every is a story. It's everything's around me. I'm constantly. I've got thousands of books now with the cell phone. I got tons and tons of apps that store all kinds of ideas. So it's really, it's really how I live my life, and I can't really shut it off. And um, it's very difficult at times because when I want to, it won't. So that's yeah. kind of the process, you know. So that's I'm just trying to create. Here's another thing. After a song is written, I look for, a, uh, I like to create a landscape. So when you listen it, you see it. That's why I was never a big fan of videos because it, it's like a book. When you read a book, you have these images of the characters in mm-hmm. your mind. And then when you see the movie, it doesn't always live up, right? Same with videos to me. They make you make a video that doesn't have anything to do with that, that picture that you had when you wrote that song and, and, and made that record. So that's a whole other story. I won't go into that. Well, you know, you, so you were not a fan of, um, cause you kind of came up, you know, precious time came out in what? 81. Yeah. Yeah. So you were kind of there like right as MTV was, was being born and VH1 was just around the corner. Yep. You didn't, you didn't like that. You didn't like the, the rise of the videos. I hated it. I really did. I hated it. There were great people, uh, the directors and the people that were making the videos and, and uh, John Sykes and Chris Liss and the people off at the record company, they were all great about it. But Fred, if you had any idea how much these people spent on some of, the, <laughs> of these videos, to me, it was a, it, it didn't make any sense. Uh, you know, I don't know, I was just not a big fan. I, I, I love music so much uh, that it, I, I just want to be in the studio, that's all. I didn't want to be yeah. in the wait, because you had to be there for 12 hours and you know, it's like being an actor, but you don't really have lines and you're not really taking on a different character. So I, I wasn't my of course, friend. of course, now we look at MTV and you could question whether or not it's really a music television <laughs> station. Yes, you do. But here, I'm going to give you a little concept on MTV because they were brilliant. Obviously, they, were, they had a brilliant model because mm-hmm. if you think about it, it's really what started the software businesses and people that gave away things for free. They gave it away free, 24 hours a day. How about that? You get it for free. That way to get you involved. And once you're involved, you can't live without it. And all of a sudden, money comes in. All right. So you you had a hand in Jesse's Girl, right? And yes. that song, I mean, there, there's probably five songs that if you meet someone, it, you just automatically start singing the song. And if any time I ever meet someone named Jesse, uh, I just start singing the song. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't blame you. I'll tell you, when, when, Rick, uh, when Rick played the song for me, uh, there's, there's four people that made the record and three people produced it. That was uh, Keith Olsen, myself, and Rick Springfield. And we had a drummer named Mike Baird who played the drums. So I played all mm-hmm. the guitars and bass. Mike played the drums. Rick sang and played the little keyboard part. and uh, it was funny because when I heard the demo, as rough as it was, I knew the song was going to be a hit. It had everything, it had absolutely everything that you could want, except it was scattered. The feel was kind of stiff. It didn't feel right. There was no middle eight in it. Um, it, it needed it needed a, a, a solid direction, right? And um, I, we got lucky on that one, you know? That, that just really worked, you know? So what's a, what's a song or an album that you put together that you thought really had it? Like you thought was just going to uh, crush the world, but it didn't hit. Okay. Um, I would think, uh, but it did actually pretty well, but I thought it would do even bigger. Um, and uh, people that actually produce similar records like this said it might have been a little bit before its time. And that was a true love record I made with Patricia. It was a swing record. Uh, I based mm-hmm. the record off of uh, Count Basie and Buddy Johnson and Big Joe Turner. And I, I really had a great time. I did it in 13 days. Uh, wrote uh, a song called I Feel Lucky. That was the last song we needed for the record. I, I wrote it in one morning. And I, when the band came in, the horn section, everybody says, I got a new song, we got to do it. They go, well, we got flights. I go, I don't care, we got to make it, we got to finish this. So that was one of the records I, I really, I love to this day. I really do. I, awesome. I thought, it would do, I thought it would do better than it did. It did go gold, uh, but I was anticipating a bigger, bigger reach with that. 
Now, as the music industry has changed and we, we live in a world where we don't really talk about gold and platinum as much anymore, right. it's about how many downloads did you get? What do you, what do you think about the current state of music with, um, with the streaming devices? Well, I, I, I like it. I do like it. Um, I knew once music was going into the digital framework, I knew there was going to be changes, fast changes, mm -hmm. because to me, when a tape would go around the the, the reels, they, they would go around. I, I kept thinking, how is how is music going on a piece of tape, you know? But then all of a sudden, it went into this place where it's up in cyberspace somewhere. You know, I have a, a really good friend of mine that's an engineer. He says, if we don't, if you don't have a backup in three different places it doesn't exist. Think about it. I mean, you have photos on your laptop and whatever, if it's not up in a cloud and your laptop goes away, all your photos are gone, right? So the idea of streaming, I, I do like because it's immediate. Um, I, a lot of that I blame on um, FedEx because when they said they can, you can absolutely get it overnight, everybody thought that you could get everything right away and then from there, you know, look where we're at. So mm -hmm. I, I like it. I don't have a problem with it at all. I like it. I think streaming is good. Now, you're not always going to get great quality. See, that's the other thing with it. You're not going to get the quality that we get as a producer and musician. You're not going to hear what I hear in my studio. It's not going to be like that. Yeah, because they, they'll condense like a, a wave file down to like a crappy MP3, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Here, here's, a, here's another uh, piece to the, um, to the streaming world that I would think that you would really love and that it is – it, 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 when people have that moment of nostalgia or they hear a song, they can instantly get to it. Mm -hmm. And so like all the listeners of this podcast, guys go, uh, go and check out uh, true love, which uh, we, we find is Neil's like one of Neil's favorite albums that, and that came out in what? 90, 91, about 89, something like that. Okay. I do remember sitting down with the record company and they just got, they just changed their leadership. And the new guy was there, and he was from Germany. And I go, what is the new record going to be? I go, well, I have this idea. I want a whole swing record. I'm going to bring all these guys into the studio. We're going to play it live. <laughs> he was speechless. He goes, wait, what are you hit me with your best shot? I go, no, I ain't going to be there, pal. <laughs> so <laughs> it was it was real funny. I, I, I remember it clear. <laughs> it was good, but it's a great little record. I really do enjoy that one. Well, I tell you, um, go stream that now, everybody. And, you know, I think it's time we get to get to some of the whiskey stuff. I, I've, uh, um, you know, probably asked you too many questions before we got to it uh, in, uh, overall. But I like to get into people's, like, background in, in, in whiskey. And in, in growing up in Cleveland, what did you drink there growing up, if you drank at all? Yeah, yeah, of course I did. It was um, it was a perfect talent for drinking. <laughs> but uh, uh, by the way, my German accent was very good. I was in no way uh, making fun of that. I was just trying to. Explain oh, I thought it was. His yeah. Face. yeah. So no, I thought I, that I thought it was good. Yeah, that was good. What's that? But I, I understand why you would want to like, you know, say something on that because we we do live in a world where like every damn thing gets like thrown up in the air and shot and judged and mm -hmm. oh yeah. yeah yeah i get you know you can't see you know you just you don't think you have nothing behind it that's that's hurt for anything you just just make it a comment it just whatever so okay back to this uh my family come from bronte catania sicilia so when my grandfather had this little house and in his basement he had a still mm -hmm. and then he taught my father how to make uh a uh, plum wine, uh, wine out of grapes, all kinds of different kind of crazy spirits, and grappa, which comes from all the the. Awesome. Oh, I love grappa. You you were you grew up around grappa? Oh heck yeah, you can. Oh man, yeah, you I know, love grappa. These guys would pour it in their coffee cups, you know, in the morning, put a little bit of that. Yeah. In fact, we will get to a grappa eventually. Uh, I have a couple ideas, but we'll stick with the whiskey for a minute. So my grandfather would. Um, would you know see me and i'd sit on his lap he didn't he didn't live very long I, he passed away when i think i was like seven but he would sit in my life nilo nilo try this try this nilo and you know he'll sip you know so i kind of i guess i gotta blame him a little bit for my uh interest in the whiskey but uh that's the way it started uh for my family my grandfather i had high blood blood pressure when i was a kid 
and the local doctor says you need to eat more garlic and you need to have a glass of wine with dinner. So here I was at 12 years old having a glass of wine at dinner. Was like, wow. Yeah, it was crazy. So that, that's great doctor advice right there. Pretty good, Fred. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty good. I mean, he'd, he'd go to jail today, but you know, but, but that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so we have, I have, uh, poured some grappa on the show before, um, Alex Ebert of Edward Sharp and the magnetic zeros. Uh-huh. He's, uh, he, um, he's like really sensitive to whiskey. So I ended up pouring him some grappa mm-hmm. and I think he drank the whole bottle that night after, Ooh. uh, after I ran away with him or at, he, cause he ran away with the bottle. <laughs> yeah, well, did, was it, was it cold? Was it in the freezer or was it warm? No, it was uh, room temperature. Yeah. Okay. Because, you know, in the freezer, it, you know, it gets a nice, thick, kind of easy going down. It's not as rough. Yeah. I mean, it probably destroys the flavor a little bit. But I'll tell you, it's still a little story about grappa. I made this record called Go. Was it Go or Inamorata? Uh, I think it was Inamorata. I'm not sure. But anyway, did the record, finished it. The engineer was an English guy, a great, great engineer. And I said to him, I said, well, since we finished the record, you want to try some grappa? He says, Sure. So we started drinking grappa. Then I say, well, why don't we listen to the mixes? He goes, great idea. So I played the record back as we're drinking this grappa. That was a real bad mistake because it sounded so bad. We were so hammered from this grappa. They made everything sound so (laughs) fast. I go, oh my God, every song is too fast. We destroyed the record. But the next day when I was sober, it 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 worked. It was still okay. So... Wow. Well, grappa story, right? Yeah, I, I do. I would love it if you came out with a grappa because um, you know it's actually not. Uh, Italy didn't get a you know geographical protection on it, so you could you could get grape skins here, you know, from a winery and uh, and distill it. But you you said something that I didn't follow up when I want to now, and you and that was that you said your grandfather, your father had a still in the basement. My grandfather, yeah, Nunzio, Nunzio Giraldo. Mm-hmm. And then he was, he was making illegal booze in the basement. Oh yeah, yeah, he did that. And all my aunts and uncles were told that if anyone, I have all this, this is all in in my book that I'm writing at the moment. Hopefully, I can get it out this year. And again, it's much more prose like and much more lyrical than when I'm doing it right now. But they were told to not open the door if they saw a person with a uniform on and I'll leave it at that. But yeah, we yeah. Used to move it around the city and stuff. Mm-hmm. All right. So you are, you are schlepping, uh, booze around Cleveland in, uh, what? <laughs> Seven, that's why I, I, did, I wasn't schlepping it, but, uh, my family was, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So you, you, you actually have alcohol in your DNA. Well, that probably explains why your whiskey is actually, you know, pretty good. Well, thank you, Fred. We're trying, you know. Try to, I, put a, I, I tried to get the best team I could together on this. And I, I'm the first guy that's going to tell you. I, I love spirits, and I love the idea of sipping and conversation. So that mm-hmm. was the thing behind as long and as well as the musical ambassadorship. But that's another subject we could talk about. But it's like a band. You know, you, when you put a band together, you got to get all these players, right? And they have to be in sync with you 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 have they have to stay in their lane they have to have the same vision right and then once you get the team and the band you go and you make music now if i'm not gonna i'm not gonna tell the singer how to sing i might give suggestions but i'm not gonna tell that person how to sing right and i'm not gonna tell a, a violin player how to play a violin so so i put a team together and that's that's I, I'm the first guy that's going to tell you I'm on a bourbon journey. I'm on a whiskey and spirits journey, uh, vodka, all the spirits, but I am no master. I never will, but I will be surrounded by some of the greatest people that I can find. But you're also a fan. You're not like, uh, you know, you're not just like using your notoriety and fame to, um, you know, or your partner's fame and notoriety to, to move whiskey, you know? Nope. Nope, that was the number one. I had a lot of uh, messaging at the very beginning. We stick through it throughout our company, right? Number one is uh, I'm a celebrity, I'm a musician, and I'm a proud musician. And I always told them that the juice had to be at the star. 
not not the celebrity, not the pushing, not the all that stuff. No, the juice had to be right. So when I did the taste profile for the bourbon, we lined up 16 different, 17 different bourbons that they had to keep giving me the test. And since I'm not like a professional like you, Fred, I take one little tiny sip <laughs> and I take it, I go, oh, that's a little too sweet, a little too this. And all the other guys are like, you know, here I, I'm, I'm thinking, these guys are going to be hammered. So they're making notes, they're my master distiller and all the people. Then we got to the end and he poured a 16 Hirsch, right? 16 year old Hirsch. So I took one sip of that. Now, after about an hour and a half of, of sipping all these things, I thought I'd have no control over what my mind would tell me what would be good. As soon as I took a sip, I went, I looked at him. I said, that's it. I want it to be exactly like that. He just went like this. He looked at the bartender and said, why did you have to pour that? And yeah. then he went on to tell me that that round, just that one round of, of the 16 was probably, you know, $1,500. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, it's one of the more rare bottles. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good one. I really do enjoy that profile. That it's very good. Yeah, uh, uh, one of my friends and colleagues uh, state thinks it was the best bourbon ever made. I would disagree with him, but it's definitely in in a top ten for me. So it's uh, it's a fantastic uh, pour. So that's the standard you're holding your team up to. Wow. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Now, now, trust me, you know, I'm not going to go around saying it tastes like the 16. It doesn't, but, but we're, but there is a standard and we're going to keep, you know, keep creating and blending and doing all the things we do to try to stay as high as we can in the standard and give the best that's, product we can to people. You know? That's great. So, all right. So let's take a look. What I like to do is I like to, um, I like to actually pair, I like to pair whiskeys to music okay. and I like, so I would like you to to now pair your pair your whiskeys to songs you've you've produced or written. Okay, uh, right away, uh, it, it, and it's not because of the title. I would say uh, "True Love" from the True Love record. I would take that one uh, just because the slinkiness of the feel of it. The, the you know. Fred, you're a professional, so you hate to hear the word smooth. So I, <laughs> you guys have a whole different language. I, I mean, I, I, I don't have that language. I can only tell it's you, okay. I, won't, I won't use the word sweet. I won't, I promise I won't do that. But I think that because it's slinky and smooth and, uh, and it just kind of rolls around. That, that would be the 12 reserve. That's where I would get that. Um, but on the other hand, um, uh, you know, players, you know, musicians, uh, I learned from a bass player that played on the true love record. He says, you know, you mm -hmm. can hear happiness. You can hear anger in a person's hands on a record. And I never knew, I never thought about that. He goes, well, listen to this guy. Can you hear the anger this guy has in his hands? I said, wow. So with that in mind, when you listen to some people and you hear the thing, you can, I relate more of the whiskey to actually a performer and a musician right okay you know how uh to me you know sinatra golden boy sinatra you know that's that's what i attain i want to get something that feels like that smoothness in his voice you know tony bennett big joe turner which has a little more of that thing not like a winoni harris who's a shouter you know have you heard the news there's good rocking today that's like jumping at you maybe the grappa will be that <laughs> winoni's grappa I love it. I love it. And what else is coming down? What what else is coming out for you guys? Do you have any other releases? Uh, any any new SKUs that you're doing? Yes, we have a we have a um, a vodka that we're going to have coming down the lane soon as well. We're going to now Neil now now Neil. Um, yeah. Sorry, uh, every, every, <laughs> everything was going well. I got to show you my sign. <laughs> no vodka. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough turn it around <laughs> so i actually have t-shirts too <laughs> okay did i say that no, I, i'm sorry i didn't say that <laughs> we have a bourbon cream we have a bourbon cream coming which which we love that's that looks fantastic what about a grappa grappa don't 
I love some grappa. You know, I would love, I mean, that's the thing is like grappa is one of those categories that nobody really owns. You could come in and, uh, you know, that could be like, to me, grappa is like a, a, like a long guitar solo, you know, and every one of them is, is, is different. It can be heavy metal. It can be classic, right? you know, but there's some, there, the way they hit, there's just like, um, they're like a single, it's grappa is a single instrument. And when done correctly, it's gorgeous. But when it's done badly, it's like listening to like a local band that just learned how to play in their garage. Like a fiddle player, like if somebody yeah. just playing violin. That's it. You like grappa lets you know it's there. I mean, it, don't yeah. it tells you the truth. Vodka tells mm-hmm. you the truth, you know. The, the thing about grappa too. You, you know, maybe you won't like this idea too, is, but I, I, I want to produce a vodka that, that, uh, well, let's see how I don't get in trouble with this. I oh, you're okay. That's drinkable. I, I mean, because so, most people, they can't understand it. They think it smells like rubbing alcohol and, you know, and everything else. And a lot of the nose on, on grappa is not as good as it tastes. Maybe it's like a, yeah. a cheese. You know, you smell and you go, oh, this could be awful. But then when you try it, you go, hmm. Meanwhile, which I never knew, I don't, you know this, I think bourbon and certain whiskeys are phenomenal with food. To me, oh, yeah. Even more than wine to me. I mean, neat, of course, but they're just having that sip with, man, I think it, I think it really enhances the food greatly. Do you have a favorite pairing that you like to do? Well, I love the the, the pepperoni, salamis, and cheese that go with with, uh, with bourbon. I, I love that. I don't eat a lot of carbs these days, and I'm kind of off bread, but I'm thinking bread and butter would be phenomenal. Um, it yeah. is. It is. And this is, uh, given the, the state of, like, you can't leave your house, uh, maybe now's the time you revisit bread, you know? And... Uh, <laughs> No, 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 Fred. <laughs> no, <laughs> I've already gained three pounds since being home because, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, potatoes sound really good to me now. Uh, you know, it's, I'm trying to, I'm trying to be cool though. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It is, uh, carbs, carbs are the enemy. And by the way, uh, bourbon, as far as I know, it's not, I mean, it's, it's sugar. It, it gets processed like sugar. So it, mm-hmm. in your liver. <laughs> But see, here's the, but this is how I look at the, the bourbon compared to wine. For a Sicilian Italian, a bottle of wine is like a glass of wine to someone else. You can drink a bottle of wine with no problem at all. But if you have bourbon and you take the little tiny sips, it seems to go a lot further along than a bottle of wine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But wine, you kind of, you, you have, it's not a sip to me. It's more of a drink. Bourbon is a sipper for me. For me. Yeah. Too. Are there any other spirits you really love, like scotch or cognac or armagnac or anything like that? Um, I love armagnac, uh, cavados. I, I, I enjoy those uh, during certain times of the year. You know, I, mm-hmm. um, I'll give you a little background on my high schooling, which was awful. I was horrible at high school and I couldn't concentrate. And uh, the guidance counselor said, I'll show you where I'm going with this. He said to me, you know, you're a distraction. If I give you all the credits to graduate, could you not come back in the 11th grade? And I think you have another mission in your life. You're a musician and I don't think you really belong here. And I says, well, thank you. And and the funny part, ironic, is that I'm on their wall of fame at the high school. (laughs) I didn't really even graduate. Let me walk, uh, go down the aisle because I stayed away. But anyway, when I quit, school when I left school I decided to read as many books as I could find all the classics so touring early on in my early days of touring I would read books that reflected the period and the, the location of where the books would be reading like the crucible in the Boston Massachusetts area or William Faulkner Tennessee Williams Louisiana in the south in the west Steinbeck you know all these different areas right so with spirits to me certain times of the year seem to tattoo themselves to to a certain spirit like i won't drink scotch anytime during the year but if it's around christmas or the holidays or new year's yeah i'll, I'll have a, maybe i love the reflections of the mccallum reflections i like that so i enjoy that armagnac too if it's cold it's nice to have a little of that hanging around 
Um, you know what I mean? That's, that's how I, I do it seasonal, I suppose. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. You know, right, right now it, it, it's hard for people to get those things. Uh, but there are still ways you can go on lo- online somewhere like uh, Drizzly or Mash and Grape, even Total Wine, depending on your state, and get uh, and still get some of those fine spirits. And I guess I kind of want to wrap it up with this because we are in this uh, strange time, um, and we we are both in an, the music industry in some way, shape, or form. Like I I help uh, Danny Wimmer. Uh, produce uh, music festivals mm-hmm. and um, am represented by by shelter music so I have a, a lot of friends in the music business and you're obviously like right there in the thick of it um, how does is how is the music industry do you think going to be long term impacted by this shutdown because live nation stocks not looking good all the festival promoters are hurting what are your thoughts well, uh, I'm going to go back to the reason I started the Spirits Company, and that was I wanted a musical ambassadorship. The messaging was important. When I found out that Sunhouse didn't have a tombstone and that uh, uh, the, the blue societies raised money to get tombstones for these great blues artists that are recognized by the blues, uh, by the musicians, but outside a musician circle, maybe not a lot of people know these people, but they are our heroes and pioneers and they don't even have a tombstone. So the idea of starting the spirits company was to, to do an ambassadorship. And, and what I mean by that too, is to give the sweet relief of places like that to local bands. Now there was a time if you were a local band, you can go in a club and a club owner would say, I'll give you 1200 bucks. because you guys pack the place. Then it happened in that late eighties. Well, you have to pay us to play. So we do things where we pay the band to play at venues, right? And at mm-hmm. bars and things like that. So we want to give back to all the musicians, the hardworking musicians out there, because, you know, I had my Uncle Sam. My Uncle Sam was one of my favorite uncles, and he said to me one day, he said, Neil, he goes, you know what? He goes, I thought of every way possible to make a living. He goes, without working, he says, don't be a musician. <laughs> That's what he told me. <laughs> I remember to this day. So, but once you're a musician, you're, you're born a musician, you're a musician for life. So how it will continue. Well, everybody uses that word, the new normal. We'll have to develop a new normal. I mean, uh, with the podcast, certainly the, the internet where you're streaming, uh, people can play and, and you can be seen and heard through the internet and things. But there's nothing like live music, right? I mean, no. it's, it's real. You're in the room. It's there. It's a moment. That's the other thing about playing live. When you play live, you create a moment. Just like what a spirit. Fred, you could say, you know, I, last week I, I had whatever I didn't think was a very good bottle of bourbon. I, but I was with my friends and we had just the greatest time and I really enjoyed myself. It, it, you have an image of that, right? Mm-hmm. So now what these musicians are going to have to do is, is find a way to get back into those clubs and find a way to, to entertain. And they will, they will, because when this is over, there'll be a new normal. But when this whole process is over, there's going to be a situation where people are really going to be in need of it. And, it, you know, you're locked down, right? Everybody's locked down. They don't leave. The first chance of leaving, when you finally get to leave, it's going to be like prohibition ended. Really? I mean, people are going to be so excited. They're going to be ready to listen. They want to feel good. You know, the thing with music, too, is funny. I say it every night when when I'm on stage or when I'm talking to kids and and people that want to know things about the industry and stuff. When you hear a song, you remember the day that you first heard it. You may have broke up with your girlfriend, with your boyfriend. You may have got a new job. It was a good moment. It was a bad moment. You could be in the elevator and you hear the song come on in the elevator and you go, oh, my God. God, why do I have to hear that song for again, right? So those, those moments are always going to be there. Just like the person, when I went to see The Who, my very first concert, I went to see The Who, and I saw Pete Townsend, and I was 13 years old or whatever, and there was reefer in the air, and I'm watching, and I'm going, my God, that is my hero. I want to be him because I want to write songs. I want to be a musician. That, I want to be on that stage. There's a million people out there that can look at YouTube and, and learn, but to be in the room changes everything. So I think they'll find new ways, you know, necessity, mother invention. You'll find a way to be heard and seen. 
Yeah, it, it's all about adapting and diversifying, and and there's no change in it. You know, no, so it's the new normal, like they say, it's it's going to be a catchphrase, and but it's a real one. You know, it's real. Mm -hmm. I wish I knew what it was going to be, but all I do know is that when you're a musician, it's music. If you want to feed your family and have a life, it's a business. So music business goes hand in hand. And if you don't have a business mind, you're not going to be able to be a sustaining musician and have a life to take care of your friends, your family, and yourself. And that's a problem because people, when you, when I started off, I, all I was, was the, the side of the brain that wants to write, create, create, create until I had managers and people ripping off and stealing and doing all this because I didn't pay attention to the business side. So for these people out there that want to make a business out of it, you got to pay attention to that business side too and find a way to make it work. But we're going to support it. Uh, our brand supports musicians and mu uh, musical uh, ambassadorships. So we're going to continue to do this. And that's our message. And that's what we're yeah. going to continue to do. And yeah. make them spirits. So you like them, Fred. If you like them, we're happy. We make them for yeah. you. Yeah. Well, and you know, I'm a very honest person. And if I didn't like it as much as I would, I like you, uh, I would still tell you. And, um, you know, I'll be very critical when that vodka comes out, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> You're not even going to try it <laughs> unless I change no. it. Maybe no, that's... Ba vodka barely sucks. Maybe it'll just... <laughs> <laughs> That that could be a new tagline for you, yeah. Um, but you know, as we as as we close out here, I, I just I, I'm you know your your words really struck with me. And so, what is your what is your advice for for a musician who hasn't actually made it yet, you know, but they've got the talent, they can't go anywhere and play. What's what's your what's your uh, advice to them right now? My advice to every musician is to read books, to study, but read novels, read literature, read, 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 because it gets your brain going, because it leads to this. You've got to write songs. You have to write songs. If, you, if you're a musician, unless you want to be a virtuoso and, and there's going to be opportunities in orchestras, and there's going to be opportunities um, as just a player, uh, which is a very uh, respectful position to be in. But I tell everybody, write songs, learn to write, study songs, dive into them, learn, um, go back, go listen to Irving Berlin, listen to everybody, dissect songs. That's what they need to do because I truly believe that there's a Hank Williams somewhere that's in somebody's basement that is just sitting there, it's just such a freak that he can't get out or she can't get out, but she's writing these brilliant songs. That's, that's the message, you gotta write. You gotta try to write. If you can't write yourself, five people you can write with. Try, learn, 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 and study. Study the masters. Learn, if you're a guitar player, learn gypsy jazz. Learn um, all the great players that came before us. Study them all. Listen to folk music. Uh, like you, you're, you're a, a, an aficionado. You know bourbon. You know whiskey. You, you didn't all of a sudden wake up one day and went, wow, this is real good. You know, you didn't do that. You had to study. You studied and your palate got mature and you and you stayed focused and you worked hard. Here's the other thing. People don't think it's hard work. It is extremely hard work. You got to yeah. work your butt off if you want to be a musician. If you want to be noticed, if you want to be heard, you want your message out, you better work like hell. And, yeah. and this, to me, slowing down the world right now is a, is a perfect opportunity for people to sit at home and write and learn and read. I mean... That's, that would be my message. Continue to learn, 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 seek knowledge, listen to people. Right on, man. Well, how can people follow you? How do they get your, get in touch with you? They can get me at the official, it's called the official Neil Giraldo. I don't know if there's an unofficial me out there somewhere, but it's official, official Neil Giraldo at, uh, it's a Facebook page, official Neil Giraldo. I know I have Instagram pages too, Neil Giraldo, spelled G-I-R-A-L-D-O, not like it used to be spelled when I joined the Darren Japan early days. Um, and then I have other, other things too that they're building. Well, I got a Wikipedia page. I also have a website that's being built that's almost finished. I can give that. Uh, information to you at another time once it's all together. I'm, as you can tell, uh, I'm not I'm not 
I, I love social media. I love contacting and talking to folks and doing stuff, but it's really hard for me to do. It's difficult to me to type every day on Facebook and show everybody what I'm eating for breakfast. I, that's really hard for me to do. I can't, I, I just, it just doesn't, I don't know, but I do my best. I'm trying. Yeah. You know, I, I think you're doing okay. And, uh, you know, the main thing is, is that, you know, today's world, as long as you're putting one thing out a day, you're fine. Yeah, but I would, no one, no one needs to see what you ate for breakfast unless it's, you know, bourbon. Yeah, that's exactly right. Now you can also go to recordbourbon.com. That's a website that tells everybody what's on our, what's on our palette there and what we're doing in the products. So that's a good one. And three chord bourbon Facebook page. Right on. All right, Neil. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, so that was uh, Neil Geraldo. Neil is a great interview. I really thoroughly, um, I, I, I didn't know where that interview would go, but I just felt we had like a great chemistry. And although it was done by Skype or Zoom, rather, it was it, it was it was great. And um, man, he's just he's a cool dude. Like that's a guy like I just want to hang out with. You know, I don't say that often about uh, a lot of people I interview, but I just like kind of want to hang out with him and you know drink bourbon and smoke a cigar and you know talk about. Cleveland, like Cleveland's one of my favorite cities. I think it's very underrated. So go check out Neil. You know, you don't have to go very far to find him. He's he's all over the place with uh, with quite um, with quite the, the you know the digital footprint, if you will. It's funny, you know, hearing him spout him off there at the end. It's like, guy, you got you got a lot of followers out there. So go check out Neil when you get a chance. Now the answer to the trivia question was based on Neil's hometown, and that was, what was the name of the proper distiller there when his grandpa was making illegal moonshine? And the name of that, and the company still in business today, is called Paramount Distillers Incorporated. They were you know, privately held since 1934. They had sold in 2011 to uh, Luxco, and Luxco... If you're if you follow my other podcast, Bourbon Pursuit, Bourbon Pursuit, Kenny and uh, Ryan had a really great interview with Luxco to tell you the story about them. But they're one of these, you know, large uh, holding companies that are you know getting it going and and doing all kinds of, um, uh, you know, getting doing acquisitions and growing and growing and growing. And so in like ten, you know, twenty years, Luxco might be one of the larger you know spirits companies in the in the world so so they acquired paramount in 2011 so that's going to do it for this week's episode next week we have clown from slipknot and it's actually going to be dropping on wednesday so be prepared to see a um to see a podcast on wednesday instead of friday like you normally do but thank you so much for joining me. Make sure you're hitting that subscribe button. Give us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or however you listen to this podcast. Uh, click the like button on YouTube and just give us give us something. You know, let us. That's well, it's all what it's all about. Like the algorithms of these of these uh, podcast providers. It's all about who likes it and the algorithms and what reviews they get. So help us get spread the word too. This is still a new podcast, but Spirits Business just named it one of the the must listen to podcasts um while you're in quarantine. So very excited about that. Thank you, Spirits Business. And there's not going to be any listener feedback today because, well, I gotta go home and make dinner. So as you are listening to this, just know that in the back of my head I'm thinking to myself, I got to chop an onion or bake an apple. I don't remember. So I will be following directions when I get home and uh, go check out my Instagram stories to see how badly I messed it up. <laughs> so that's going to do it for this week's episode. Until next week, remember, vodka sucks unless it's being used for hand sanitizer. And I'll see you later. Cheers. Mm. I'm gonna take you on a ride.